probably the number one question I'm asked is, did I always want to be a writer? Um, I would like to have a story like Margaret Atwood, who I hear was, you know, walking across the high school football fields composing poetry, uh, but nothing um, could be further from the truth for me. I was and continue to be a terrible speller. Um, it was nothing for me to get upwards of 20% de um, taken off for spelling mistakes on uh, exams in high school. So English was my worst mark. Um, in grade 13, I took three maths and three sciences and English only because I had to in order to graduate. Uh, when it came time to head off to university, uh, one of the things that I, I, one of the criteria that I used for picking my courses was that there was no essay requirement. Um, I graduated with a degree in biochemistry without, without having to uh, write a single essay. And then I went on and did my master's in business, but uh, took as much finance as I could, so very much continued to steer clear of the written word. Um, despite these educational and early work life choices, uh, there was in fact evidence of my artistic leanings early on. Uh, I, as a teenager, was in the ballet studio sort of four or five nights a week. And uh, I also um, was really sewed an awful lot of my clothes and designed quite a few of them as well. So I think in high school I was feeding my creative side through the dance and, and the sewing. Um, and while I was at IBM, uh, I was, that's, I, I spent, um, I was there for 10 years, I, while I was at IBM, I was always enrolled in uh, a continuing ed class at night school, so um, I, everything had an artistic bent. I took painting and drawing and art history and woodworking and interior design, and eventually I hit upon creative writing, but it really was a whim uh, more than anything else. I had um, the Ryerson University catalog at home and I was flipping pages and you know, saw this creative writing class and I thought, well, why not? Why not give that a try? Spell check's been invented, it'll be fine. Um, so I, I, I took that class and uh, right from the very first um, session I was smitten. I remember our very first writing assignment was describing our, our childhood bedroom. Uh, it was a one-page, you know, setting assignment, and I probably spent eight hours crafting it, and I, I wanted it to be perfect, and I loved doing it. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of the end. I, there was a four-year period that followed where I was still working full-time in the corporate world by day, but cramming in a bit of writing or else taking a class in the evening. Um, the, the decision to leave the corporate world and, and get serious about my writing um, came out of a conversation with my husband about having a fourth child. Uh, while I was still um, working and doing the writing, I, I had three kids and they were you know, quite young, so life was super hectic. And uh, when my husband and I got married, um, we naively thought we'd have five kids of our own someday. We're from families of five and we love our big boisterous families. I, I, when we had that conversation, I was very much of the mind that I couldn't fit one more thing into this very full life, uh, let alone another kid. And it was really my husband who suggested, well, why not leave the corporate world? Why not get serious about your writing? It was something I had said that I wanted to do, but it was sort of something I envisioned as being in the far off future. I had all that education. My friends were corporate people. It was really kind of my view of myself. Um, shortly after that conversation, I did take the plunge and, and start writing um, full time. Uh, and I, I should admit that I didn't have a fourth child. I often forget to say that part. <laughs> um, I spent the first year writing short stories, and I did have a handful of them published in literary fiction magazines, though I could certainly wallpaper my office with the rejection letters that I got along the way. I did pursue having those short stories published in book format um, fairly superficially. I sent them off to, I think it was Harper Columns, Random House, and uh, McClellan and Stewart. And by the time uh, they were rejected at those three publishing houses, a whole year had passed. And I had the first draft of the day, The Falls stood still uh, well underway. And I could see that my writing had matured. And I really became content to sort of treat those stories um, as an exercise in learning to write. Before I put uh, fingertips to keyboard to work on The Day the Falls stood still, I researched um, for four months. Uh, I, you know, I talked to list librarians and archivists and um, all sorts of different experts, and I, I was continually, you know, I was warmed time and time again by sort of the willingness of people to, to share their expertise. Um, you know, I had a, 
uh, a local fisherman in Niagara Falls who wanted to research what kind of fish would be in the, the river for me at that time. And the local, the local history librarian at the Niagara Falls Public Library was always you know, digging up histories of some of the buildings where my characters would take place. And she sent me off to uh, some of the local museums to see um, artifacts uh, that were relevant to the story that I was telling. Uh, I wrote the first draft of The Day the Falls Stood Still in about a year and a half, <clears throat> and then spent the next two and a half years rewriting it. So, so uh, Wayson's message about rewriting uh, was very much my experience. Um, I rewrote um, on my own and took it as far as I could. And then I have a good friend, Anya Sato, another writer who were each other's first readers. So she read it for me, and then there was more work. And then when I got my agent, um, there was two massive rewrites under her guidance, and they took me a whole year. And then there's the rewriting with the editors. I hope that I'm never going back to the two and a half years uh, rewriting hell, but um, uh, it is certainly um, what it took to get The Day the Fall Stood Still uh, ready to be sent out to the publishers. Um, once the book was sent out, it uh, was sent out on a Tuesday, and by the end of the week, we had the wonderful news that it would be published by HarperCollins in Canada and Hyperion in the US and Random House in the UK, and that it would appear in Italy as well. Um, more good news came shortly before that book hit the shelves. Uh, Barnes & Noble, so the equivalent of chapters in the U.S. had picked it as a Barnes & Noble recommend selection. Um, it's a designation they give to four or five books a year, and what it amounted to was, you know, sort of 60 copies of my book at the front table at every Barnes & Noble across America uh, with, you know, posters and literature for book clubs, so the kind of things writers dream about, I think. Um, that endorsement was enough to get the book onto the, the New York Times bestseller list. Um, the Painted Girls also uh, was on the New York Times bestseller list, and I, I would attribute that book finding its way onto the list because of um, the, the massive sort of media coverage it got. I mean, when the book first came out, it got a full page review in People Magazine and Entertainment Weekly's must list, and it was covered by, you know, half the newspapers, and it seemed like all the, the big magazines down there. Um, so, you know, that was, that was certainly wonderful. I am, you know, astonished and delighted by the, the success that my books have found. I, when I was writing The Day the Fall Stood Still, I, I can assure you sort of my highest hope for the book was that it would someday find a readership in Canada or at least in, in Niagara Falls. Um, so I certainly feel uh, very fortunate. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and, and talk about um, where uh, my, my two books came from. So for The Day the Falls Stood Still, um, I started with setting. It's probably a little bit unusual. I think probably writers more often start with plot or character. Uh, but I think uh, starting with setting for me it was the result of growing up in a town with such a storied past. Uh, you know, we've got Annie Taylor in her barrel and Blondin and his tight rope, the maid of the mist in her canoe, Adam Beck in hydroelectricity, Isaac Brock in the War of 1812. Uh, the list goes on and on. And if you add into the mix uh, the staggering beauty of the falls themselves, I don't think that starting with other than setting uh, was ever really a possibility for me. Um, the first thing I did was I read a bunch of texts that sort of surveyed Niagara's history. And as I was reading, I was really looking for sort of the kernel of a story that showcased the wonder that I feel when I stand at the brink of the falls. I'd grown up seeing the rusted out hull of the old barge that is still lodged in the upper rapids of the Niagara River. Probably lots of you have seen it as well. And I grew up hearing uh, about um, Niagara's riverman, Red Hill, who had rescued the men who were marooned in that barge uh, back in 1918. Uh, I grew up knowing about the um, spectacular ice bridges of yesteryear that would form at the base of the falls. Um, and I grew up being told the story of the tragedy that happened in 1912 when a bunch of people were out blithely crossing the river and the bridge suddenly gave way. Um, I'd heard stories about how Red Hill uh, helped clear the ice that day. So as I was reading these texts, um, these Niagara surveyed, you know, books surveying Niagara's history, um, this sort of lore of my childhood really ignited for me, and I became more and more certain that my main male character would be a riverman loosely based on William Red Hill. Uh, so that's, that's Red Hill on the right there. Um, Tom Cole was the character that I came up with. Uh, like Tom, 
Um, Red Hill had an uncanny ability to predict the um, often erratic uh, Niagara River. Uh, in his lifetime, he hauled 177 bodies from the river. He rescued 29 people, and he assisted a handful of daredevils. It was said that Red Hill could forecast the weather just by listening to the roar of the falls, uh, and also that he would wake in the night and know that he would find a, a body uh, tossing in the rapids in the following day. The following day, so. The day the falls stood still really came from, I think, my experience of growing up in Niagara Falls. Um, I knew before I wrote the novel that I wanted it to be set in Niagara Falls. I knew that it wanted to, I wanted it to be historical, and then I ended up writing a, a story that was in, inspired by uh, the life of Red Hill. I had quite a different experience um, for the Painted Girls. Um, it was me it's been mentioned that the Painted Girls was uh, in, um, inspired by Edgar Degas' very famous sculpture, uh, Little Dancer, age 14. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I, I came uh, to discover this sculpture and, and uh, you know, want to tell the story of the young model for the artwork. Uh, so as a teenager, I spent um, a lot of time in the ballet studio. Uh, and there were, in fact, Edgar Degas ballet girl prints tacked to the walls uh, in the studio where I did most of my classes. Um, I felt a real kinship with Degas ballet girls. Uh, sometimes he painted them in all their glory on the stage, but more often, uh, just like I was, they were stretching at the bar, sweating it out, fixing their stockings, scratching their backs. Uh, I could look at Degas' dancers and see their love of dance uh, no different from my own, and I could see their commitment to what many would argue is the most grueling art form in the world. Um, so years and years later, I would come upon a television documentary on um, focusing specifically on Little Dancer, age 14, and I think because of my early exposure to Degas' artwork and because of um, um, you know, all my training in classical ballet, the documentary completely captivated me. I would learn that young Marie Van Gotham uh, had modeled for the artwork and that she lived on the lower slopes of Montmartre in Paris, a few blocks from Edgar Degas' studio. Uh, her father, a tailor, was dead and her mother was a laundress. Um, Marie was sent to the Paris Opera Ballet School um, on the eve of her 13th birthday and she was promoted to the corps de ballet at 15. Uh, both her sisters, her real life sisters, also trained at the Paris Opera Ballet School and were promoted to the corps de ballet. Uh, the ballet was the dream of many a Parisian laundress or sewing maid. Um, it offered a girl a chance um, to escape the gutter, a chance to find fame and fortune, if she had talent, if she had ambition, and unfortunately, in many instances, if she was able to attract the attentions of a wealthy male admirer of the dance. Along with their own private boxes at the Paris Opera Ballet, uh, male season ticket holders had purchased access to the Foyer de la Danse. Uh, the Foyer de la Danse was a space built for the express purpose of facilitating encounters with these young ballet girls. Um, it was a sort of gentleman's club, a place where high life met low life and where mistresses were sought by um, industrialists and noblemen with enough clout to advance a girl's uh, career in the ballet. When Degas unveiled Little Dancer, age 14, in 1881, uh, it was to reveal something very strange uh, given the standards of the day. It was a two-thirds um, two life-size wax sculpture of a young girl dressed in a real fabric tutu, slippers and bodice, and wearing a wig of real hair. Uh, the public took one look and were aghast. Um, they didn't see a young uh, ballerina dressed in her practice clothes. They saw a whore. Immediately, they linked Little Dancer with a life of vice and uh, young girls for sale. Um, they called her a flower of the gutter. They said that her face was imprinted with the detestable bromus of every vice. This seedier side of the Paris Opera Ballet really flew in the face of my sort of teenage notions of those ballet girls that were attached to the walls. 
Um, I could see, uh, after I'd seen this documentary, that the lives of those ballet girls had differed from my own in, in dramatic ways, and that in particular, um, the life of Marie Van Gotham had differed from my own. Uh, and I really became convinced that hers was a story that I wanted to tell. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.